All right, you've read the title of the talk, and I'll try to live up to it. I want to talk about a dis mathematical discovery that I made, novel I, or not, I don't know, but I'm hoping to get feedback in that regard amongst others. Um, and what I'm talking about doesn't have a lot to do either with APL nor even very much with forensic DNA. It's just one particular task, an important one, um, that I encountered in developing a program to analyze DNA evidence. So I look at functions of which these are some graphs in two and three dimensions, and it goes up to four and five, but I can't draw those. And uh, you'll see certain characteristics about, about these. Well, one is, it's, it's a common problem all over the world, all over science, all over mathematics, to have a function of a handful of variables um, that is concentrated in a small part of the domain and that you cannot integrate um, algebraically or abstractly. You have to do it numerically. So that's what I'm looking at and that's what I've got to talk about. Uh, but I will give you a little tie-in with the DNA business, just in case you're interested or nosy. This here is what the evidence from um, DNA, what DNA evidence looks like when it's analyzed. And this is essentially a signature of the several people who were responsible for the evidence. Presumably several people deposited a few cells of which contain DNA, and we get this pattern where the x-axis tells um, what genotype the combination has, and the y-axis tells you how much of each there is, roughly speaking, plus or minus random variations. The second thing is a chart showing overlay of suspected contributors, so each color rectangular bar represents the known genotype of su suspects, which you can see overlap to a considerable degree with the evidence, at least horizontally. How much it matches vertically is going to depend, among other things, on the proportions that each of these people has. My graph is just drawn with proportions of one-third, 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 partly by coincidence. It could be that if we increase the purple by 40% and decrease the, whatever, lemon by a bit, that things would match up better. Anyway, however well it matches up, there's a fairly expensive computation involving evaluating gamma functions and things to decide how likely are we to have these discrepancies that we see between the bars and the spikes. And the problem that we need then is to integrate over all possible proportions of the contributors, and that will be the likelihood of seeing this particular pattern from these people. So it will be the strength of evidence that we have supporting this hypothesis. Here's a little bit about, so when I started writing this program, which, my God, it was converting it to Dialogue APL was 10 years ago now. Um, some of the ideas were simple. This particular one, I decided to sort of shelve with a very simple, not very good method. So here's a, here's a function I want to uh, integrate. And the method I and my domain is, in this case, two-dimensional. Um, the two dimensions representing the proportions contributed by two of three people. The third one is just one minus their sum. And so I decided to do this simple idea. I sprinkle the domain with a handful of red dots, which I will, at each of which I'll calculate. Each dot represents a proportion of contributors. And um, within each dot, around each dot, 
I will carve out a domain that that dot owns. It's satrapy, if I'm using the word right. <clears throat> By um, this line is a perpendicular bisector between these two dots. So everything belongs to this dot. That's the idea. It's kind of a stupid idea, but it's simple. And then, in order to measure the area of those little domains, I sprinkled in a large number of black dots, like 20,000. I had some very vague heuristic for deciding how many is enough. And so the number of black dots in an area is a in pretty good indicator of how big the area is, because I can't calculate it directly. I'm not smart enough. Um, and somebody told me that, these, that this way of tessellating is called Voronoi cells. So for each red dot, for any particular red dot, I can calculate the height with this function c that I'm not going to explain. Um, so I'll have a height, and I'll have an area, and I multiply height by area, and that gives me a volume. And if I can add up the volumes for all of the areas, I'll have my integral, uh, approximately. If the areas were very small, I'd have it more accurately. So that's a Monte Carlo estimate of first the area and then the prism. And there's a word Riemann sum for this kind of uh, method of doing a numeric integration. Okay, so now the next step is you have to refine the areas. But you don't want to simply chop all of them in half because that would be way too much work. You want to find the suspect, the one, you want to find the one that's going to be most worthwhile splitting. And the way, I, the simple-minded way to do that is that in each cell, for example, this one, I choose a second point at which to calculate. And my second point I choose from among the original black points because it would be hard work to introduce a new point. I had to do a whole lot of bookkeeping to get set up. So now I have two versions of my vertical prism, one uh, going up to the blue and one going up to the red, and the difference between them is my delta volume, and that's how much, that's what I'm going to, that discrepancy I can carve into by splitting this cell into two. And I'll look around to see if there are other cells that are even better candidates, and let's assume for simplicity that I'll choose the cell with the largest delta V, and that's the one I'll split. Um, okay, the title of this talk says that I stumbled here and there, and that's kind of the fun. So I noticed after a while that this heuristic stalls after a while. You let it run on a case, and after a while it just doesn't move forward anymore. The difference between high estimate and low estimate is fixed. And the reason is that you run out of black dots. So eventually you come to a cell that has no unused black dots and you can't split it anymore. This algorithm doesn't crash as it happens, it just doesn't split. Sort of a, I know, but I won't tell you. I learned that from a five-year-old when I was six. <laughs> um, now, okay, I gotta do something more sophisticated. Now, as I said, this is called a Voronoi cell, so I did a little research, and I found that it's not straightforward to calculate the area or even the boundaries of, a Voronoi, of the Voronoi cells. However, it did appear that there's a Japanese mathematician, by his name, who lives in Switzerland, who studied these things and maybe he knows how to do it. 
And I was very serious about the project, so much so that I was actually almost seriously <laughs> contemplating going to Switzerland. But I knew how, con how expensive that is. So I, I, I had to do something better. I'm going to take a little detour and show you a little bit of detail about the concept of Riemann sums. So here's an easy example because it's fewer dimensions. And the idea is you put up a bunch of rectangles and the areas of the rectangles approximates the integral. And in this case, the um, I take a bunch of points here indicated by the arrows and I straight up compute the height to the curve. And then I position my block so that the computations are in the middle of the block. That's one way to do it. And then if you split the bars, you have a picture sort of like this. Uh, which may be fine, but as I maybe mentioned already, Evaluating these heights is pretty expensive. I think somewhere between several computations, a small number of calculations per second to maybe thousands in my application. So a real time hog. Um, so, and here's a typical, the typical kind of function that I'm up against. Actually, let me take, let me show you something kind of cute. I think it'll just take seconds. And I've always wanted to do a demo, a live demo on a talk, never worked. So here's the program that calculates mixtures. And in this case, we're assuming two contributors named K and L, and a total of four because there are two more that don't have names. Oh, well, I can see it very well. <laughs> I have no idea. Let's see, Will. What should I do? Should I kill the PowerPoint? I can't find it to kill. I think, OK. All right. So this is one of my first forms. So K and L are hypothetical contributors to a mixture called F. And we're going to consider, we're going to fix what really should be a nuisance parameter at four total contributors. So we have two is geno genotype I know, two genotype I don't know. I'm going to compute something or other. I'm not going to explain my fantastic progress chart. Um, I'm going to let it. But it's running to some sort of decision that it's a stopping rule. When the high estimate and the low estimate hit the stopping line, it will say, I've done enough. And if I get impatient, I can say, you've done enough. <laughs> and then. Um, this is simply a tool that I wrote so that I can see what the hell is going on when it was confusing and under development. So now I'll plot, and this one really is slow because this one doesn't use any clevers. It just goes through a grid. And it finds out that I'm trying to integrate and that looks like this. You may think it's terribly easy, but even though it looks like you have zero everywhere except here, no, it's just rather small, but it's a huge proportion of the area, so you can't ignore it. If I change to looking at this with a logarithmic uh, abscissa, then you'll see that there are some details in the neighborhood of this spike that you can't uh, uh, ignore, in addition to some over here. And you'll also see from these dark lines, what they tell me is that actually the mesh, the grid here, is much finer where it needs to be in order to see the details. So here's the situation we're in. 
and here in a little more detail is the process of, adapt, of uh, the adaptive integration where we choose places that need it for refinement. So here's the first refinement. And in summary, you split a bar where the delta is big. And then we can split again, of course. And it seems a very simple thing, fab fabulous for two dimensions. The issue is how do we generalize this to three, four, five dimensions? That would be enough, five. And um, I noticed that some, um, let's see, oh, I decided to summarize this. So within each cell, we have to compute at least two values so that we can have a high estimate and a low estimate. And then the hypervolume is the height times the area. By area, I mean in general hyper area. I, there may be a general term for what I'm thinking of as an area, but it's not necessarily two dimensional. And um, here's an APL expression for the delta V. Okay, so how are we gonna generalize to more? I had noticed that somebody else who was doing a similar project had used a um, routine called R cubature. And I thought, wow, does that mean that I have to learn how to use Dialog's R interface and trust a bit of code that I can't read and don't understand and can't trust? And that's, you know, two big ifs. But let's look at the picture. So when you have one independent variable, you break up the domain into line segments. And there's really no choice. In two, how do we tile it? Well, maybe the obvious generalization of a line segment is a square. Clearly, that's what our cubature is doing. And then at the next level, here's two cubes. Here's the base cube and here's the ceiling cube. And this is, please believe me, this is a four-dimensional picture. It's not a kite. Um, and then we can split these cells sometimes. And then we're going to have intersections that we have to keep track of and decide what to do when we later split a nearby cell and how many vertices we compute when we come split a cell. And there's a lot of housekeeping. And I'm very good at detecting when something will be more work than I want to take on. <laughs> so I was shy about using cubes. On the other hand, how about using irregular triangles? Well, that seems idiotic, too, because how the hell do you determine the area of a triangle? And even if you know the answer to that, and even if you love the concept of, rate of generalizing triangles to simplex, which you can do in any number of dimensions, how do you determine the, the volume, area, whatever of those? So that had me stymied for a while. And here's the summary of what it means for me to be stymied. I know how to do the cube volume. It looks obvious how to split with parallel lines. Um, then I, if you think about tessellating a, vol, a 3D area, a 3D place with cubes, you'll soon see that you can ha easily have a one-to-one -one mapping between cubes and vertices. Just attach the upper back vertex to each cube, and that makes a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and there's publications talking about these things. And one thing I learned minus that I learned from a publication is directional bias. If there's a ridge that goes along the edge of a, of a in the direction of the boundaries, great. If it's diagonal, little trouble. And as I said, I thought the housekeeping is going to be tough. Then I learned, actually, 
the area of a, of a simplex is trivial. It's just, a de not only is it just a determinant, but a legacy of Roger Huey is that there's a very fast defund to do it. How to split, I'll discuss in a moment. You've got a huge advantage here. Simplexes can touch each other all over the place. They're not limited. They're so unlimited how you can stack them. And um, it might be something new. I found literature on using simplexes to estimate the maximum of a function, but I've not seen doing what I'm doing, the volume. Okay, let's look at splits. Well, or whatever this slide, yeah, that's what this slide is about. So a simplex definition is simply one more point than the um, number of dimensions in the space, and every pair of points is connected to one another. Therefore, you have two star in straight lines, and the only con constraint is that you can't have collinear points or coplanar points and so on. They have to be essentially random. Um, so this is a zero simplex, this is a one simplex, a triangle is a two simplex, a tetrahedron is a three simplex, and it never stops. Here's a nice drawing of a three simplex. What we're gonna do is, when we decide to cut it, to carve it, we'll pick a cut point along a particular edge, and then we'll put in these two lines, and this is what we'd have done. We'd have broken it apart in this simple way. You can do that easily, and that, ex that extends to any number of dimensions. You'll always cut it into two pieces. Now, I against, in somewhere in the literature, I saw them describe a second way to cut it, and I made the same mistake myself, I'll admit early on. If you try to cut it by introducing a cut point in the middle, you run into um, a slightly embarrassing situation because this method never cuts a line. So the lines stay as, start, as long as my starting line, which means that they don't cover a small area. They're stretching all over the place. It's like sharing a bed with somebody that won't <laughs> tuck in. Um, and the other thing I quickly noted by my monitor, monitoring tools is that when I cut a new cell, there could be many other cells that share, an, that share the edge that I'm cutting. So here's two cells that share an edge. But if we look from the bottom, there's the two cells that I'm talking about, but you can see there's room to put in many more cells there, an unlimited number. So if I decide to, to cut along the common edge, I'm gonna cut not one cell, but a dozen of them. And the extra breaking down may not be as useful as the reason I started cutting at this point in the first place, but it is free. Now here's a problem. This is just a question. I have a feeling there are tricks that I don't intuitively understand beyond what I can see. Certainly you can have any number of, a lot of neighborhood chip, but you have some com complications that I don't know about. Okay, so roughly speaking, here's what's going on. We have an initialization step where you tessellate the domain with just a handful of simplex cells. If you're lucky, your original domain is in fact simplex shaped, in fact a regular simplex, and it's easy to cut down, uh, which is what I, by luck, do in my application. And then in each cell, you make some calculations. You calculate all the vertices and you tuck, and they, all the areas and you tuck that away. Then you iterate. So you find for each cell its extreme edge, the one that connects its minimum corner with its maximum vertex. And then you look, and the extreme edge is measured by the delta V. It's the um, 
max vertex, I call it, and the min vertex being the vertices that give me the highest and smallest height of all the vertices of this simplex. And then I find the most extreme edge among all the cells, and that's the one I'm going to split. Now, where along this line do you split? That is trickier than you might think, and I don't have enough slides or time to explain it. So we'll leave that for, I don't know, coffee. But we, as I said, we split all the cells there. And um, so here's what's going on. Um, just to summarize, I think this is. So simplex tessellation is typically going to give you these numbers of efficiency compared to cubes. It depends on the number of dimensions of the domain. If you have the minimum number where the problem arises, a two-dimensional domain, then roughly speaking, you're going to have to make a calculation for every other simplex. But if you get up to four dimensions, which is typical of the problems that in practice I'm doing, and other people who were running into the same problem in totally different arenas. Um, 11 is a typical number for the rate, for the how many fewer calculations you have to do than the number of cells. Another benefit that I haven't talked about except trans tangentially until now is a stopping rule. This is really important. People who were doing this stuff by Monte Carlo have the most cockamamie reasons for saying, okay, I've computed enough. I would liken it to this. How many of you have lived on the earth and seen a hill? Okay, nobody, but I'll explain it. <laughs> if you go up a mountain, sometimes it's very steep. And eventually, it's not so hard. And you think to yourself, I know, I'm hitting the summit. It rounds off. And sometimes you're right. And sometimes it's a fake summit. But I think the Monte Carlo methods essentially are relying on the summit geometry. If you get to the point where you can walk without pain, OK, we can stop. What's much, more, what's much better is if you have a high estimate and a low estimate. Then as you refine your, um, your grid, the grid that you're using for your rebound sum, the high estimate and low estimate get closer and closer together until some predetermined tolerance is, uh, is met the difference between the high estimate and the low estimate. Um, so I'm very happy. I felt very, I felt very um, incomplete until I saw how I can do high and low estimates with this stuff. And finally, I will talk just slightly about the business about how to where to cut. Of course, originally I cut halfway. But then I soon found that in many cases, cutting halfway makes no progress that you can detect. And the reason is, think of looking at a parabola or a, like this. And if you cut, what you want to do when you cut is, you want to essentially cut the volume, um, not the volume in two parts. Well, I should have, maybe I could, it doesn't matter, I wasn't planning to have time for this. But if you have a curve, it can perfectly well be that, you, that in order to divide up the discrepancy into two equal parts, so that each cell is better than the parent cell, um, you may need to put your cutting mark 99% of the way toward one of them and 1% from the other. That would be quite ordinary. 
Um, so what in fact I do now is I randomly calculate, I, make a, I double my number of calculations just for this. I make a calculation, perhaps at the midpoint, and then now with three calculations along the line, a vertex, a vertex, and the midpoint, I can do some kind of interpolation and figure out what's, what's likely to be about right. And I have a cleverer idea that won't cost that, but I'm not sure it's worth <clears throat> implementing since it won't, it won't actually Saving a factor of two on this part of the program doesn't necessarily save us a factor of two on the whole program. So that's my story about integration. I hope you feel integrated. <laughs> <laughs>